In this video, we'll be turning this into this. Welcome to Zorba Zorb Gaming, my name's Lachlan Linton Keen, and welcome to the first installment of many of our new Minas Tirith terrain making guide. We've got a massive community project underway here in the Australian Middle Earth community. We're going to be working in isolation all around the country together to build a true scale wargaming board for Minas Tirith, the white city from Lord of the Rings. We're going to have members of our community all over the country working on separate elements, building walls, building towers, painting up their armies and to make sure that at the end of isolation when we get together for a massive celebration game we've got to bring all of those bits of terrain together into one harmonious wargaming board and so to make sure that that all fits that it all tessellates I'm going to be releasing a series of video guides and accompanying templates right here on the channel the first round of templates are available for free for download down in the description below and uh, we're going to be looking today at the most basic section just a standard section of Minas Tirith wall we're going to look at how to craft some really realistic stonework, making sure that's detailed and beautiful, just using some extruded polystyrene foam, but how to make that look super, super special. And of course, we're also going to be tackling the Minas Tirith battlements, which are of course a bit of a nightmare for many sculptors all around the world. Battlements, there's lots of different complex shapes with all the curves and crenellations and parapets. And to make sure that is the easiest sculpting terrain making experience you'll ever have, I'll be showing you how to use our wicked little templates as well, so that we have some beautiful Minas Tirith terrain at the end of it. So, without further ado, let's dive on into the first section of Minas Tirith. The entirety of this build is going to be sculpted from foam board or extruded polystyrene. I've got myself a sheet here that is 1200 by 600 millimeters, and this is a really fantastic material to work with because it's great to sculpt, we can give it a really realistic finish, and it's really easy to source. I just got this from my local hardware store in the insulation section. Now, our first section of Minas Tirith walls is going to be 280 millimeters wide, and the entire wall will be 300 high. So the first cut we're going to make is taking a long strip of the short edge at 280 millimeters wide. Then we can just cut that strip in half and that's going to give us two squares that are 280 by 30, the perfect dimensions of our walls. Now this sheet is 50 millimeters thick and I'd like my overall wall to be 100 millimeters thick. So we can just glue those two squares together and then we've got ourselves the perfect piece for our main wall structure. Now I'm going to be fixing these two sheets together with some adhesive and physical bonding. I'm going to put some timber skewers and stab them into each of the corners and the center, line those up and then pull it back apart and we'll glue it up as well. I'm using a high strength PVA, it's called Weld Bond, so it sets nice and fast but has a really strong bond and we'll glue that all up across the flat surface as well as the timber skewers. And once that is finished and jammed and pressed up together, we'll weight it for a little bit as well uh, and then it's gonna be beautifully strong and we've got the core structure of our wall section. And now it's time to get into our detailing. Sculpting a stonework texture into foam is kind of a fundamental crafting skill for terrain making and it's actually really easy to do. You can employ some simple techniques that don't take a lot of time and they give you a really fantastic result. Now because Minas Tirith is quite a well designed city, it's got a really regular brick pattern, I'm going to be designing this and marking it all up with a ruler before I start making any cuts or sculpts. So what I'm going to do is take my ruler along the height of my wall and I'm going to make a marking every two and a half centimeters. That's how high my individual bricks are going to be. I'll put a mark on either side and then just rule some lines across and those are going to be my rows of brickwork. And now what I can do is come in with a large blade or a scalpel and gently cut into the surface of the foam. We only want to cut two or three millimeters down, just enough to break that foam so that we can turn that into a brick. Once you've cut all of those lines, we're going to widen those groove or grout lines by just grabbing a pencil and just dragging them down the cut line. This smoothens it off and makes it look nice nice and natural, like an actual gap between various bricks rather than a cut by a scalpel blade into foam. And already we can start to see our stonework coming to life. But of course, we need to do our vertical lines to create our individual bricks. I've had a look at the reference photos of Minas Tirith and most of the bricks are fairly uniform, although there is a little bit of natural variation. So what I'm gonna do is take the first two rows at the base of the wall and kind of roughly mark out where I want my bricks to be. Just doing it lightly in pencil until I get the right size. They're gonna be sort of roughly 
roughly two to three centimeters wide, uh, although there will be some variation. And then once I've got those two rows done, obviously I'm doing two because you'll do the bottom to the full side and then you'll start the next row up with a half brick and then continue. So you've got that traditional overlay brick pattern. Then what I can do is grab my ruler, place it along the vertical lines of the brickwork and then mark every second row of bricks to either the first or second row and I will very quickly and easily mark out the entire brick pattern. Now when I do this, I sort of move my ruler around a little bit every second row so that I get a little bit of natural variation all throughout the brickwork pattern and then not every brick is going to be the same size. And using the exact same method as we did with the horizontal lines, I'm going to grab my scalpel and then individually cut all of those vertical lines to create our brickwork pattern. Just like before, once all of those lines are cut, I'm going to grab my pencil and smooth over all of the cuts. Once you've done the two main faces of the brick wall, it's of course time to do the top. Now this section is already marked by a big line down the center because of course this is two individual foam sheets glued together. And I'm just going to grab my ruler and take each of those individual sheets and mark them in half and then in half again to create eight separate rows along the top of the battlements. Now when we're doing our vertical lines, we need to make sure that we line up the two outside rows with the bricks on the front. So that's our starting point. Just grab your scalpel straight away and you can cut all of those brick lines in and then that's going to give you the average length of the top thinner bricks on this top surface. And then for all the rows in between, we'll just do the exact same process as we did on the front walls. Mark those out, space them out, get some nice natural variation that keeps within your sort of tolerances so all your bricks are relatively close together but it doesn't look perfectly uniform. Cut them all out once you've marked them up and then grab your pencil and smooth out all of those joins. And then the main brickwork sculpt stage is finished and now it's time to get into the surface detailing. Our detailing stage effectively has three phases, the first of which we focus on the overall surface texture to get rid of that foamy look and really bring us into the landscape of rock work. And we're going to use a tried and true method for that, which is imprinting some texture with a scrunched up piece of aluminium foil. So grab yourself a huge sheet of foil, roll it up into a ball, and we can roll it back and forth across the foam, press it, dig it in, crunch it right into that surface. And you'll notice that the foam just takes all of the different scrunched up textures and imprints of that that crumpled up foil and it imparts a really lovely stony finish. Don't be alarmed if it starts to smoosh various bricks together. You can always grab your pencil and separate them back out along the groove lines if they need a little separation, but really have a go and crunch into them and create some lovely texture all over the three faces of our wall. Our second stage of detailing really makes the stonework pop. This is where we create a relief amongst the stonework, some different depths on various stones, which creates a nice realistic look and makes it look not just like a foam block that's been carved. So I'm gonna grab any kind of flat sort of implement I've got here, uh, the case for my spare knife blades, but a chisel or a ruler or anything really would work with the right kind of shape. And we're just gonna push into the foam and depress specific targeted blocks along the block surface. So you can do some sort of every second or create a few interesting shapes and you want to push them down sort of quite a few, you know, three, four mil even deep into the stone. And some of them don't have to be so deep. Some of them can be a little lighter just to break up that flat surface and create some different texture. Now, once you've depressed those various stones, you'll notice that the stones you've pushed on might have lost a little bit of their texture. So just grab your foam roller again and go back to those flattened stones and re-establish that detail profile. Get that lovely rocky face, that stonework and, and really kind of wear into them so that they still look just as lovely as the ones that are sitting up a little raised from the surface. So now that our main wall section is well on the way, it's time to start working on our battlements. And battlements can be a bit of a hurdle for some people because often they've got some complex shapes, maybe a bit of curvature, which can be quite difficult to carve. Plus, you've got to make sure you space them appropriately across the stonework, particularly when you're building a big modular wall set like this to make sure that the form repeats appropriately. So rather than creating a set of complex measurements to try and replicate every time I carve, what I've done is put together a template so that I can step and repeat the pattern over over and over again, and it's going to be the same every single time. And that template is available for free for download down in the description below, along with a whole range of other templates for this entire Minas Tirith city build. This is of course important for us because we need to make sure that all of these pieces that are being built in isolation that come together for our community build have the same dimensions and will fit together perfectly. So of course, a template is our go-to technique. The easiest way to use the template is to just print it off on an A4 sheet of paper 
and stick it down on a piece of thin card and that way you're going to have a nice durable template surface and then just cut that out with a sharp scalpel blade. It might take you a little while because of the curves and you want to make sure that you get it nice and exact but you can just cut close to the lines and you'll get a really long lasting template which you can then drop onto your foam surface to create an outline every time you build a battlement. So the Minas Tirith wall has two battlements, the inner battlement and the outer battlement. The outer battlement uses the full template with all of the crenellations and parapets running across the top, whereas the inner battlement is just a little low wall to stop men from walking off and stumbling off backwards, so it's simply the lower portion of the template without those crenellations. So we're going to need two sheets of foam to make those parapets. So to get those two sheets of foam, I cut two rectangles from my main 50mm sheet, one of them 280 by 90 and the other 280 by by 65 and then I just cut along the cross section by cutting the sheet in half and then each of those halves in half again and that gave me four sheets for each battlement that was 12.5 millimeters thick and that means I'm ready to make a whole lot of wool. So once you have your foam sheets, it's time to of course cut out your battlement. So I'm going to grab my foam sheet for my outer battlement and just place the template and hold it firmly and securely in place on the foam surface. Grab my pencil and draw all the way around the outline around the template. As we pull the template away, we can see a fantastic version of the battlement and now it's time to cut that out. Now the easiest sort of advice I can give for this is to make sure all of your knives are really, really sharp. You won't kill many orcs with a blunt blade because when you're cutting extruded polystyrene, if you have a blunt knife, it will simply tear and pull the surface. So we want really clean cuts. I'm going to start off with my large scalpel and I'm going to make all of the long cuts that I can down the bottom of the archways just by sawing backwards and forth and getting a really nice sharp finish but not trying to deal with any of the curves, just blocking out the larger sections. Then once all of those are cut, I'm going to grab a smaller blade, a small fine point scalpel, and slowly saw my way around the curved surfaces in a zigzag action. If you stay nice and top down and just gently adjust the angle of your knife as you go around the curve, it's really easy to follow the groove and tear away those archways. Once we've finished the lower archways, we're going to use the exact same process with our fine point scalpel to gently cut around our crenellations at the top of the battlement. Once we've cut around each battlement, we can take our small scalpel and cut out that join in the negative space between each of the crenellations and then simply pull away the gap and we can see the battlements really starting to take shape. There's just one little detail left to do and that's on the outer surface of the outer battlement. There's actually a slope section in between each crenellation and what that does is it allows the defenders to lean over and shoot down and get enemies that are closer to the base of the walls. So I'm just going to extend on the front side only the curved section of the parapet up the top and take that down an additional 5 mil but only cut that through on the front side and then I'll grab my small scalpel and slide in from the base on an angle cutting back up towards the top of the end of the parapet on the inner side to create a lovely ramped surface down from the inside to the outside. So now that we've cut out our battlement, it's time to start on our stonework. And we're going to start on the inside of the battlement where we haven't created those ramped crenellations. Our first horizontal line is just going to be slicing across all of the base of those parapets. And then we're going to make another line about 5 millimeters just above the archways. And then a third line halfway between those two outer lines. And that creates two evenly spaced rows of bricks on the inside of the wall. Now one piece of advice when you're cutting this brickwork, make sure you're very very light. This is only 12 and a half millimeters thick and we don't want to go weakening any of those joints particularly on the top line of brickwork we don't want to encourage any of those parapets to be breaking off. This foam is strong but if you smash it it is going to break. Just like with our main wall we're going to use the pencil to widen all of those cuts and make those bricks feel really nice and natural and then we'll bring in our scrunched up aluminium foil and put some lovely surface texture all over that battlement. Obviously we only need to do uh, the top half of that surface for the inner side because it is going to be glued to the wall so make sure you don't bother texturing the inside of the arches because we want those nice and flat so that they're a great surface for gluing to the main wall section. 
The final little bit of detail for our battlements is to finish off our archways and shape the lovely slope supports that angle up towards the top of the parapet. So what I'm going to do is grab my really sharp broad scalpel, flip the battlement upside down and slide my knife down making a cut through each of the archways halfway and then stop the blade halfway down and break off that piece of foam. That's going to create a terraced effect from the full size battlement to our half size section of archway and then obviously the end and then I'm going to grab my scalpel and gently cut a curve flowing from the top to the half size and then the half size down to the base of the battlement to create a really nice flowing support. So that is our battlement finished and ready to be attached to the main wall section. Now we want to glue this in place just above the beginning of the third layer of bricks and that's going to give us the perfect little height so that our warriors of Gondor valiantly defending the walls are still covered when they're between the crenellations and then they're completely covered uh, when they're behind those parapets. So that's going to give us a really nice defensive structure. Now I'm going to glue this down with some adhesive but also some physical bonding. So what I'm going to do is cut down some skewers so they're about half their size and sharpen both ends and then stick those in the edges and the center of the main wall section and then gently slot my battlement on. Uh, once I've lined up those holes and got it in the right place I'll take it back off and then re-glue the battlement on putting a long seam of glue just above the archways and then each of the columns of the archways on the back side are going to get a thin seam of glue as well so that I've got a really strong bond for all of the components and none of those archways are going to be knocked or cracked loose. We're going to do the exact same thing on the other side. I've just made the other battlement in the same way, just without worrying about the crenellations or any of those ramped details. And that wall is actually going to be attached a little bit higher on the back, uh, so that that back wall is just a bit taller with the main wall section. So it sits about 5 mil higher. Before we dive into painting, there's one last step. We have our final layer of surface detail. So what we're going to do here is grab our foam rollers, really kind of check over the whole surface as a hole, put any imprints in any regions that are kind of flatter or lacking in detail and then once I'm really happy with that I'm going to come in with my scalpel and just drag the back of the scalpel the non-blade section across the foam, creating little cracks and crenellations, chipping away at different edges and you can really go to town on this. You can sort of sit back and just spend maybe even an hour on each piece of wall really putting in beautiful little details but you don't have to go that over the top, just putting a few cracks here and there really helps to sell the fact that this is aged stonework and really kind of sells that it's not foam basically. It gives that extra layer of detail which is particularly important as you'll see when we come to painting because it allows lots of extra little juicy recesses for our washes to settle in which makes the stonework really come alive. So the time has finally come to lay some paint on this monstrosity. We've got a lot of options for scheme. We could go for a black stone like the books of the kind of classic Numenorean stone look. We could go for a darker grey stone like Helm's Deep or we could go for the classic bright white Minas Tirith look from the movies and that's what we're going to be focusing on in this tutorial. I will be bringing a video out shortly that is kind of like a big masterclass of stone painting that shows a whole bunch of different schemes and techniques so stay tuned for that one in the future but today we're going to be looking at at a white scheme. So what we want to do is get a nice bright white prime as our starting point. So we've essentially got three options. We could prime it by hand, we could use an airbrush, or we could use a foam safe spray. Now I don't have an airbrush close by and I don't like painting it by hand because to get a nice coverage of paint that doesn't have any brush strokes, often the paint starts to get a bit thick and it takes a really long time to apply so that you don't obscure any of the detail. So what I'm going to be doing is using a foam safe primer. I like to use uh, some floral spray paints that are designed not to melt foam but there's even some uh, new spray paints at office works here in Australia which is really easy for consumers to get access to they're only like eight bucks a can and they've got a lovely bright white which will be perfect I actually don't have a white in my spray foam uh, my foam safe spray so I'm just gonna be spraying it with a dark gray and then sealing it enough with that coat that I can use my standard rust-oleum bright primer which would normally melt the foam over the top but it doesn't matter how you prime it we essentially just need some nice white stone to start. In nature, there's a lot of variation in stone. There's different hues of rock and pigments and minerals, and when castles get built, even if they're made from the same quarry, all of the different stones will have a subtly different look. So what we're going to do is begin our process by undertoning our wall by picking out some stones in different colours, and some of them are going to seem quite stark, but don't be alarmed because it does all come together in the end. I'm going to start off with an earthy brown, which might seem like a really stark contrast to our bright white prime, but it's going to be 
a really lovely undertone for some of our rocky layers. And what I'm going to do is just pick out a few bricks here and there on my front surface, pick out some of the smaller bricks on the battlements, as well as the stuff on the top of the rampart, and make sure you've got a different spread and you're not repeating any geometric pattern. Have a couple of clusters together, some single bricks spread out, uh, just yeah, put them all over the place with no visible order. Then I'm going to move on to a darker grey. This is sort of like a dark, almost blue grey, and I'm going to apply the exact same process. We need to make sure with all of these layers that we're getting a smooth, even coverage that doesn't have any brush strokes, uh, but don't be afraid to sort of apply a thinner layer that allows the translucency of the white prime to come through, and you can make some a little bit darker, so even within your grey layer and your brown layer, you're getting a little bit of variation between your bricks. You also notice that I'm not even bothering to change brush between these layers, because if I get a few layers that or a few bricks that are mixed between the two colours, that's totally fine. It's just more variation. The third and final step for this layer is to grab a really light grey. It's like a fortress grey, uh, and we're going to do the exact same technique, picking out quite a few bricks all over the place and bringing a nice light grey into the space. And that way, we've got quite a mottled look of stonework here. You can see it looks really stark, it looks really contrasty, uh, but there's definitely a lot of bricks picked out here in different colours. Now what we're going to do is blend all of those bricks together, but keep the undertoning as the lower shades, the recessed shades of these brick details. So we're going to do that by grabbing that same light grey that we just used and dry brushing or heavily over brushing over the darker grey and brown tiles. So I'm going to take most of my paint off my brush, but not as much as I would if I was dry brushing, and then move in really vigorous circular motions over all of those bricks that have been undertoned. And that will start to bring the mid-tones of those bricks back into the grey-white scheme, but we can see that they feel like they're a different colour. They've got those undertones underneath, uh, which makes those bricks look subtly different. The next step is to grab a slightly larger brush, and I'm going to dry brush the entire surface of the wall with a really bright, crisp white. And that blends all of the grey dry brush brushed areas, it picks out all of those undertoned in light grey bricks and gives them a subtle white highlight, and it also kind of crisps up the bright prime of the bricks that are still white and gives them a natural highlight as well. Once these two dry brushes have gone down, you can really see that the stone variation is a lot more subdued, but it is still quite noticeable. But as we bring in our wash, that's all going to knock together, and we're just going to end up with a really realistic modelled looking stone that looks like it was made from different chunks of stone, and it isn't a big block of foam that's been carved and painted. So our first step for our washes is to bring in a light black wash, and we're going to wash the entire surface of the model. I paint this standing up, I don't sort of lie it down and paint the surface. We're going to paint this as it stands because that allows the wash to run uh, across the foam surface just like rainwater would, just like grime would build up. And that's a really important principle when you're painting your stonework because that allows you to get some fantastic, realistic looking washes and stonework weathered effects. So what we're doing here is putting a, a light black wash all over the stone. And then while that's still wet, we're going to come back in with a darker black wash and just hit little areas, just darken up different regions. Uh, and that way the light wash that's down will act as a nice medium so that as we put darker wash on it doesn't kind of make a really hard border it blends out into the medium of the lighter wash so we get lovely graduation of tone but we can really focus on some areas of recessed detail so getting in and around all of the crenellation and various grout lines if there's big cracks and a really nice detailed section you'd like to focus on we'll hit that with some darker wash and then as we go we'll step up to kind of an even darker wash and keeping this all all in one big wet worked layer, we're going to start to make some really nice kind of grime runs going down the front surface of the wall by going up to our archway beams and then just dropping a whole bunch of pigment and letting it run down the surface of the wall and doing the same all the way across, creating almost like a streak like effect, like all the rain and grime over the years has been washing off those battlements and running down the archways and then running down the surface of the wall. And it's a subtle effect, once it all dries, it kind of fuses together, but it gives you some really lovely natural variation that just makes the stonework sing. And this is my absolute favorite layer because out of nowhere, all of the paintwork and all of the carving, it just suddenly turns to stone. It just looks like realistic stonework out of nowhere. All of the detail pops and all of a sudden you feel like you're an absolute terrain making god. 
So once all of those washes are dry, you'll see that it looks absolutely fantastic. We've got lovely, rich detail showing through and a fantastic finished stonework. And now we're going to do one last little detail, and that's just to bring in some green wash, put that in various kind of nooks and crevices, like a little bit of moss or mildew growing on the stone, just to really hint at the age and, and bring a little bit of extra color and character into the stonework. And there we have our fully finished Minas Tirith wall section. It looks absolutely awesome. Awesome, and I cannot wait until we have a huge army of them lined up and ready to defend Gondor. So there is our basic section for the Minas Tirith outer wall, and I think it looks absolutely awesome. I love how the paint job has come out. The paint job was a bit torturous for me. I went through a lot of iterations of how bright I wanted the stone, so much so, like I said earlier, I'm actually going to do a separate video on how to paint different schemes, because I've learned how to paint about four different schemes of stone. I repainted that one piece four or five times, so uh, that was a bit torturous for me, but I'm really happy with how the white city has come out in that kind of movie stone look, and I'm really happy with the detail and the stonework. I think it's going to be fantastic. In the next video, we'll be covering the rest of the wall, focusing on the various towers and different battlements and the kind of different defensive features that occur all the way along the ring wall. I'll also be working on the main gatehouse, which is going to be about a meter long when it's finished, uh, which is going to be a truly epic undertaking. I'll be doing a lot of that live on stream, and then I'll be cutting that video together at the end of the journey as well, uh, to bring that all together into a guide for you guys as well. And then we'll start to have a look at things like siege towers, various defenses, we'll look at some uh, tutorials for different minis, uh, and we're also going to be looking at Gondorian buildings. We have some amazing templates on the way from Albert Fraval, uh, a member of the Zorpazort Patreon family and one of our vibrant members of the community. He's also helping me uh, work on these templates. So as we add templates, we'll be updating that same link in the description below and more and more videos will be coming out over the next month. So it's going to be an awesome project. I'm so excited for you guys to kind of come along for the ride. Are you going to uh, kind of start something similar? Are you going to be running some community projects of your own? I know there's a, a group in, in Finland and the UK and I think America as well who we're going to sort of be taking our model and, and running their own version of this in isolation, having their community members build the various components and then bringing them all together uh, in a big celebration game day when the world is all right again. So if you guys are doing that, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, please let us know in the comments or even better, head over to our Facebook page down in the uh, description uh, and let us know. Chuck some comments up. I'd absolutely be, it'd just be so cool. It would be so cool. If you want to get in touch with our community project, head over to that same link uh, and we'll be running a thread there as well. If you're in Australia, or even if you're not in Australia and you want to build something and post it over to us to contribute to the effort, uh, that would be absolutely awesome. So, thank you so much for watching. If you're enjoying everything that we're doing here on the channel, please feel free to head over to Patreon. Uh, the Patreons are a huge part of why we can do any of this, uh, and having uh, the Patreon support, particularly through this kind of crazy time, has just been absolutely mind-blowing. So, thank you so much to everyone on Patreon. Thank you so much to everyone for watching. I will see you next time, right here on Zorpazorp Gaming. Cheers, guys.